Today's scripture focus comes from Proverbs 3, 5 through 8. It says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your path straight. Yes, Lord. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. Oh, good morning. Man, I hope everyone had a wonderful Thanksgiving. However, I, you may have suffered the same problems I did this year at Thanksgiving, where my clothes were shrunk. I don't know what it is. They should figure this out, so that our clothes should expand during the holidays. I will say this. I know that sometimes the holidays are really difficult for some of us here at the Refuge. And um, I want you to know that today I hope that all of us are encouraged by this sermon. It's something that I think we overlook. I know our society overlooks it, our culture overlooks it. But I'm here to tell you that God sees you and has a plan for you. And I know that's almost a, a common thing that Christians say, right? Is, man, God has a plan for you. And everybody says that when it's terrible in life, right? You just lost your job. God has a plan for you. I mean, you don't want to hear it. Can I get an amen? amen? But guess what? God has a plan for you. Yeah. So I don't know what uh, situation you may in, be in right now, but I really need you to understand that no matter what situation you're in, God sees you. And, and he, he knows your heart and he knows your desire. Some of us in this room, man, we desire to do what is right. We just haven't found necessarily the ability to do what is right. And we try our hardest and, and know this. We try so hard and then we fail. And it's when we fail that the enemy comes in and says, quit trying, you'll never make it. And that is not what God is about. God is not a pass-fail God. Can I get an amen? amen. Now, I know that's really contrary to real spiritual people. You know, the people I'm talking about that says, God is glad he created me. That's not this church, right? <laughs> so not only are we uh, humbled, um, some of us, uh, we don't like to necessarily declare who we used to be. But I need to say this, and this is once again unpopular. We might need to stop declaring who we think we are. Whether we think we're great or whether we think we're horrible. You really have no idea because God has a plan for you and his accomplishment of this plan is going to be done by him. Have you ever noticed why God never runs his plans for you by you first? <laughs> you wondered why God said, hey, I'm thinking about you working at uh, Burger King. How does that sound? No, Lord, I think I'd like to own Burger King, right? <laughs> And, and God's like, eh, I don't think that's good for you. He doesn't debate his plans for you. In fact, God says this, I have plans for you, plans to prosper you, not to harm you. And we go, yes, I hope it lines up with what I want. And God says, no, these are my plans for you. And you can either submit to me and have that happen, or you can continue to try it on your own. There's no gray area in that. And know this, no matter how good we think we are, we can never impress God. God will never look at us and go, oh man, I had no idea what I was making when I made you. <laughs> in fact, God says it different. God says, I know what I made when I made you. I know who you are. It's you who doesn't know who you are. And I want to show you. And we say, Lord, show me. How, how do I do this? What do I need to do? You know, I'll do anything. I'll do whatever it takes. And God says, that's the thing. You can't. No, no, no. I promise I'll memorize all the scripture. Doesn't mean anything. You cannot grow spiritually off of human effort. And sometimes that's hard for us to let go of, right? Not only because we're human, but because we're American. And not only because we're American, but because we're Texan, which makes it even worse, right? 
You know, we're like, Lord, I'll be righteous before you. Remember the Alamo? And God's like, wow, that is not what I'm talking about. But we want to. Can I get an amen? Amen. I mean, I want to be good for God. I want to do what's right. These are not false desires that I have to be obedient and to be pleasing to God. It's just in my attempt to do that, I think that I can please God in what I think would please God. And God is saying, no, the thing that pleases me is for there to be less of you replaced with more of me. And ladies and gentlemen, that is a journey. That is not a one and done thing. Can I get an amen? Amen. Nobody can say, man, I prayed and became a Christian last night. Man, I'm perfect. (laughs) No, in fact, those of us who walk with Jesus, a lot of us in this room, when somebody comes up and says, man, I just became a Christian last night. Then we're like, hold on, bro. Yeah, everything's going to change in your life, right? Because here's what we do. It's not that we have bad desires. It's not that we don't want to be good for God. It's just we have to die on how we are good to God. Because what we think is good to God is our performance. But God doesn't look at performance. He looks at obedience. He looks at not your sacrifice, but your obedience. And that's hard for us to understand. It was also hard for one of Jesus' closest (laughs) disciples to understand. Peter, who is one of the greatest disciples, had the greatest fall, the greatest failure. And we're going to go over that today. We're going to be in the book of Mark. And we'll be in chapter 14. And we'll start with verse 27. What we're going to find in the scripture is that Peter's a great guy. It's not that he's he's stubborn or malicious or egotistical. No, he wants to be good for God. The only problem is he can't let go of how he views being good for God should be. And Jesus is trying to tell him. It's got to be less of you and more of me. This is Jesus talking to his disciples, Mark 14, verse 27. Jesus told his disciples, you will all fall away. From me, For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Then Peter declared. I love that word, declared. Have you ever declared something? I will never do that again. Here we go. Right? It says this, that Peter declared. Even if everybody else falls away, Jesus, I will not fall away. And Jesus said, truly, I tell you, Peter, today, yes, tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. But Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, Jesus, I will never disown you. And then all the others did the same. Yeah, what Peter said. (laughs) Think about that. I don't think Peter's lying. I think that's his desire. He wants to be good for Jesus. He wants to be that guy that stands with Jesus no matter what. And it's not that Jesus doesn't understand that and recognize that. But what he's trying to tell Peter is you don't understand, man. It's not the way you see it. You got to let your expectations go and trust God. But I love Peter. I'm going to tell you right now, I think Peter would be a refugee. Because, you know, a refuge, man, we want to do what's right with God. We want to be good. But, boy, sometimes we can be drawn to, if it's going to go down, (laughs) it's going to go down, you know. Refuges are are not squeamish people. Can I get an amen? Amen. Yeah, okay. Y'all need to calm down. (laughs) But we understand like Peter. We're not scared of hard work. We're not scared of trouble. We've been in trouble. We've been in in hard work. Really, the problem is how we view ourselves. Some of you in this room, 
you're your worst enemy so bad that the enemy doesn't even have to work to hold you down. In fact, sometimes you go, come here, devil, look how horrible I am. And the devil's like, that was easy. Notice this. Jesus tells Peter, you're going to deny me. And Peter says, no, I will not. We skip to verse 66. Let me kind of tell you what happens in between those verses. Peter tells Jesus, I'm down for whatever. I have no problem dying. In fact, Scripture tells us that when they came to arrest Jesus, all the disciples were scared. You know what Peter did? He drew a sword. He cut the ear off a man that tried to grab Jesus. And what do we say? That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. That's what's up. Let's go. He must have been born in Texas. Texas, Jerusalem, same thing. But what does Jesus tell him? Scripture shows that Jesus says, get away, Peter. Stop. You don't know what you're doing. And he takes the man's ear and heals him. I don't know if it made that sound. Doesn't, doesn't say in the footnotes at all. I just added that. But look what happens. Jesus gets arrested. And Peter follows Jesus going, anytime you're ready, Jesus, I'm ready. Go ahead. Because he knows Jesus is God. He has seen Jesus do unnatural things in miracles. He has seen Jesus make the lame walk and the blind to see and, and the deaf to hear. He has seen Jesus raise people from the dead. He knows he is the deity of heaven, the son of God, Emmanuel, God with us. And Peter is expecting any moment for Jesus to rise up and conquer and Peter will be right there with him. But Jesus didn't do that. Jesus went before Pilate. And Peter's out in the crowd going, I'm ready. Everybody else can walk away, but Jesus, I am ready. And they begin to accuse Jesus, but Jesus would not defend himself. And I wonder if Peter was going, why is he not defending himself? You're God, don't let him talk to you that way. But Jesus kept quiet. Even Pilate came up to Jesus and said, Jesus, do you not understand? They're wanting to kill you. Why don't you say anything? And I love Jesus' response. Jesus looks at Pilate and says, they can't kill me. I give myself to them. And that blew Peter's mind. Why would he give himself to them? You're God. Come on, stand up and fight. I'm here, I'm ready, Jesus, let's do this. I see how it can go down, and I'm ready. And I believe Jesus looks at Peter with those eyes and says, but you don't understand. You got to let go, Peter. And I wonder if Peter sat there and went, man, any moment Jesus is going to show him who's God. And then he watches Peter get condemned. I mean, Peter watches Jesus get condemned to death, and they take Jesus, and Peter watches them beat Jesus with inches of his life. He watches Jesus be mocked and spit on and carry the cross all the way to the point. And I wonder if Peter's going, any moment, he's going to show him who God is. And he watches Jesus get crucified and put up on his cross. And I wonder if Peter's going, come on. You have the authority and the power to come off that cross. Why won't you do that? What Peter didn't remember is what had happened before Jesus was arrested. In the garden when Jesus was doing business with his father. When Jesus was honest with his father and said, Dad, if there's any other way this can happen, please let it be because I do not want to have to go through this. However... Not my will be done. Yours. Amen. Not me, dad. You. And his dad said, son, you must die. And that is when Jesus went, yes, sir. And he was quiet. And he didn't defend himself. And he died on the cross out of obedience. 
obedience. If there's ever an example of dying to self, when Jesus had every right and every authority to stand. I mean, we understand because we watch these things, right? And we, we watch Jesus get crucified at Easter and, and, we, and we go, how could they do that? That is ridiculous. I would have never let that happen. Would you not have Peter? Amen. Think about what you're saying. The truth of the matter is, if we were there back then, we would be the ones with the hammers and the nails. Don't make any mistake about that. You and I are sinful and we need a savior. And we need a God that is on his terms, not ours. Next thing you know, Peter walks off and I'm telling you, I think Peter's defeated. Because everything that he expected should happen did not happen. And I think that hurt Peter. And so there Peter is standing there. And this is what happens. It says, while Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she looked closely at him. And she said to Peter, you also were with that Nazarene Jesus. But Peter denied it. I don't know what you're talking about. Then he went out of the entryway. When the servant girl saw him there again, she said to those who were standing around, this guy right here, this guy, he was one of them too. Again, Peter denied it. And after a little while, those standing near said to Peter, yeah, you're one of those that were with that Jesus guy because you are a Galilean. And it says that he began to call down curses and swore to them, I don't know this man you were talking about. Immediately the rooster crowed the second time. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows twice, you will disown me three times. Listen to this part. And Peter broke down and began to cry and weep. Peter had finally been broken of self. He finally came to the realization I can do nothing without him. Peter goes kind of into hiding. In fact, he has to only go back to the people that were with him when he followed Jesus. And how would you like to have been Peter having to show up in front of the disciples? He walks into the room with the disciples. The disciples are like, hey, there you are, Peter. Where have you been? Surely you held fast and you didn't deny him. Peter's like, yeah, I did. I failed, I failed, I failed, I failed. And imagine the disciples. Then why did you declare it? Peter says, because man, I walked on water with Jesus. I declared that he was the Christ. But I couldn't let go of what I think should happen. And I couldn't just trust Jesus what he was doing. Ladies and gentlemen, I ask you that question today. Can we let go of what we think should happen? And can we trust Jesus with our lives? So I'm here to tell you right now, American Christianity is losing that understanding. American Christianity is not surrendering. They're declaring. We need to stop declaring and we need to begin to surrender. It's not about who we are. I'm not going to brag about me. The only thing I can brag about is my weaknesses. For where I'm weak, he is strong. Let me tell you something. If that's true, then God is extremely strong because I know how weak I am. I'll brag about how fool I am. People ask me all the time, especially in pastoral circles. This is hilarious. But it really helps me because I don't ever have to get in a debate. People go, Pastor Travis, what seminary did you go to to become a pastor? I go, I went to an Ivy League school. Only the smartest people get to go there. Texas Tech University. And they're like, really? You didn't go to seminary? Well, what did you study in in school? Communications. What is that? I still don't know to this day. I don't know. They said, did you graduate? And I say, yes. They're like, what grade point average? You ready? 
two, seven. <laughs> That's it. They're like, you barely graduated. I was like, I know. My parents were crying. They were like, God is real. He took that, you know. And people go, then how, how, how are you doing this? And I'm here to tell you right now, ladies and gentlemen, for me, Pastor Brian and, uh, Pastor, Brian and Pastor Allen, it ain't us. It ain't you. However, I look out in this room. I've seen you change. Man, you're not the same. But, but let me explain this to you. Look at where Peter is. He is a failure. He has failed. The enemy is all over him. The enemy is saying, you can never do this. You absolutely deserve to die. And there Peter is with all the disciples and he's done talking. I wonder if they went, Peter, you doing okay? And, uh, okay, and I think Peter's like, just don't talk to me because I have nothing to say. Everything I thought I knew, I do not know. And I'm just, once again, I've, I've learned this from the recovery community, and it's so beautiful. I'm just glad to be here. Amen. And they hand you the mic. What do you got to say? Right now, I'm just glad to be here. And somebody else take this mic. Peter's finally at that point. I'm broken. Next thing you know, Jesus appears. This is the third day after Jesus has died. And Jesus appears. And all of the disciples are like, oh, It is true! Jesus did it! Like, it's so amazing! And all of them are declaring this wonderful thing. It's cool to declare that they had nothing to do with it. It was only Jesus. Where do you think Peter is as soon as Jesus shows up? You think Peter's like, hey, Jesus, what's going on? No, I believe Jesus shows up. I bet Peter's like, oh, I better get out of here. <laughs> I'm the biggest fool. It says that Jesus eats with them. It doesn't say that Peter said a word. In fact, Scripture doesn't show that Peter even addressed Jesus. And there they are eating, knowing that the last time they ate, Peter declared how awesome he was for God. And now that they're eating, he is nothing before God. And then something happens. Verse 15 of John chapter 21, it says, When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Peter, son of John, do you love me? I want to stop right there. He's at the table. Just get me through this, man. I am just the biggest fool. All of a sudden, Jesus addresses him. Hey, Peter, come on, man, look at me. Do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said, you know that I love you. Then Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Peter, son of John, do you love me? Peter answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Then Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said, Peter, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time. He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Then Jesus said, feed my sheep. Let's stop right there. You can learn so much in this moment, ladies and gentlemen. Please open your heart. May the Spirit speak to you today. You think Jesus doesn't understand you and see you? I promise you the Spirit of God tells you on a daily basis, do you love me? Oh, but Jesus, I'm a failure. I'm not asking about that. Do you love me? Because that's what he did to Peter. He looked at Peter and he didn't say, ha ha, thought you were tough, didn't you? He didn't harp on him. He didn't even talk about his failure. Can I get an amen? amen? He just asked this simple question. Do you love me? Ladies and gentlemen, if you want to grow with God, it's not about how much scripture you can spit. It's not about how much praise songs you can sing. The question is, do you love him? And Peter says to Jesus, you know I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. 
That's it. Feed my sheep. He didn't say, then you need to fast. A lot. Or he didn't say, boy, you need to absolutely learn how to sing. He didn't say you need to dress different. He said this, feed my sheep. And I, I promise you, Peter was like, yes, sir. And then the second time Jesus says, Peter, look at me. I don't want to. Peter, look at me. Peter looks up, what? Do you love me? Jesus, you know I love you. Then feed my sheep. And I wonder if Peter's going, okay. And you know Peter's like, please don't do it a third time, man. And Jesus is like, Peter, no, no. And Jesus said, Peter, I'm not asking you. I'm telling you to look at me. And Peter looks at him and he says, do you love me? And I love Peter's response. Jesus, you know all things. What he's saying when he says that to Jesus, he's like, I know who you are and I know who I am not. You don't have to ask me because you already know. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, Peter, feed my sheep. And we have to understand the simplicity of it. It is not complicated. We're the people that make things complicated. We're the ones that when we fail, we actually listen to the lies of the devil. And he loves to create chaos. Jesus is making it as simple as possible to the one who has failed worse than you and I. You are not Peter. You have not failed like Peter. You failed pretty good. <laughs> but you're not Peter. And yet Jesus looks at Peter and says, do you love me? He says that three times to him. Do you love me? You wonder why he's just saying those things. Understand this. The two greatest commandments are these. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. So no wonder Jesus is looking at him. Three times you deny me, but three times I'm going to ask you, do you love me? Yes, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Peter, do you love me? You know all things, Jesus, you know I love you. You got the first one down. It's the most important. Everything else hangs on this. And look at what he tells him three times also. Feed my sheep, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. Second commandment, love your neighbors yourself. Love God, love others. That's it. Oh, but pastor, I got all these problems. We're going to go over that here real quick because I know you got those problems. I got those problems too. But Jesus has made a way for us through the problems. You know why? Because he's got a plan for you. And that plan is for you to begin to experience accomplishment in your life. Some of us are like, don't say that word accomplishment to me. I've tried to accomplish all I've done is fail. I got the paperwork to prove it. <laughs> Jesus doesn't look at that. Jesus just looks at you and says, hey, get focused. Do you love me? Oh, but Jesus, I used to do this and this. I got these court cases. I've done all these bad things. And Jesus goes, stop. Do you love me? I want to. Then feed my sheep. And he's going to ask you that every day. Do you love me? Yes. You see, here's what God has put in the DNA of every one of us. The desire for accomplishment. And I'm not talking the way that America looks at accomplishment, right? We always look at the end result. We look at our athletes. We look at the rich. We look at these people. And we say, oh, I wish I was like that. But what we don't want to go over is the journey that they took to get there. Amen. I'm going to tell you this quick treasure golden nugget that I want you to take with you today. Quit trying to accomplish the big things and start accomplishing the small things that God is asking to accomplish today. And in order for you to do that, you got to quit complaining about what you don't have and be grateful for what you do have. Amen. 
We cannot afford to get sucked up in the way our culture is today. Complain, complain, complain. I'm telling you this right now. I'm so tired of complaining, I'm going to complain about it. <laughs> well, if they just fix the government. <laughs> I'll tell you something. The government's always been that way before even, even we were here. Government will always be that way. Scripture tells us in Ecclesiastes there's nothing new under the sun. I hear this from Texans, and I love Texas. I am a Texan. I hear it all the time from Texas. We need to secede and create our own government. Why? So we can recreate corruption? Well, how do you know that'll happen? I can tell you why. Because humans are involved. But the question is, what are you doing today that's right in front of you? I gave this example in the first service. I loathe going to the grocery store. Anybody else not like going to the grocery store? The reason is because I want to get in and get out. I want three things. And if I go in the grocery store and I just want three things, there's always somebody in front of the three things I need that are looking at everything. <laughs> and then if I finally get my three things and I'm like, okay, what am I looking for? The shortest line. I want to get out of here. Where's the shortest line? That one has three people. That one has four. Ooh, this one has one. I go get in that line and I'm like, thank you, Christ. It doesn't matter what line I get in. There's going to be an issue. There's going to be a price problem. The machine's going to mess up. When I went Wednesday this week, I had found it. Lied only one guy in there. And I'm like, yes. And I go. And I'm like, all right, come on, come on, come on, come on. And here's what this person does. What's my total? Okay. Pulls out a check. Just put down my name. Uh, wait a second. It's not my name I write here, is it? It's y'all's. Where am I? And I'm just like, are you serious right now? I mean, I'm about to jump back there and go boop, 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 swipe. I'm out. Right then I get convicted by God. Has anybody been convicted by God? Do not be afraid of being convicted. Know the difference between the Holy Spirit convicting you because, and not condemning you. Amen. There's a difference. Conviction is a beautiful thing because it makes you look at your own junk. Yes. Condemnation is what the enemy tries to do. Yes. Therefore, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. But there's a bunch of conviction. And there I am, impatient and angry, and God says, what have I told you? What have I told you about grocery stores? And I know you're going to laugh at this, but I'm here to tell you, it's as true as anything between me and God. Before I go into grocery store, I don't care where it is. I don't care in what town it is. I don't care which branch it is. God says, you need to be still. And I have to look at God and go, okay, I'm going in. <laughs> I'm going in. But Lord, save me from me. This is going to be a wonderful visit because I'm not going to try to hurry. I'm going to enjoy it. And that's when it happens. And you may go, come on, that's not that big a deal. It is to me. Yeah. It's huge to me. And if I can just accomplish that, praise God, then I can work on accomplishing something. Some of you tomorrow, you're going to go to work and you have the worst attitude at work. Let the Holy Spirit tell you. Be grateful for the job I gave you. Amen. And absolutely wake up tomorrow, even though you don't feel like it, and most of us won't. Declare for yourself on who God is. Lord, because of you, you created this day. You have given me this job. Therefore, I am grateful, and I am not going to complain. Now, I want to say this disclaimer. When you decide to follow Jesus in that, just know everything at your work is going to be complain-worthy. Right? You're not going to get your parking spot. All these things. The whole thing is the Lord's going, let's walk it out. Accomplish it. Accomplish it. You may come back to work after work tomorrow and go, I did it. Praise God. And you know what God does? God doesn't go, about time. God goes, yes. Congratulations. Well done. Let's go to tomorrow. And I'm here with you. And I'm going to walk with you. Now, notice this. I want to say this, too. Some of us are going to go tomorrow with the greatest idea not to complain. And we're going to complain horribly tomorrow. 
we are going to fail. And we're going to show up on Monday night and God's going to remind us. Ask you not to complain. Oh, no, I messed up. I told her, oh, I should have done that. God, I'm horrible. I can never get it straight. And God's going to say, chill out. Do you love me? You know I love you. I'm just not good at this. God says this. The sun comes up tomorrow. And scripture says, my mercies are new every day. Oh. You mean if I fail? God doesn't kick me. God goes, cool, let's get up and try again. That's why I have grace. That's why I have forgiveness. Get up. Amen. And here's what you're going to find out. Here's what we're all going to find out as we go. It doesn't matter what anybody else has to accomplish. It's what God's asking you to accomplish. Some of you, you have destructive behavior, and God's going to say, you're not going to be destructive in this area tomorrow. God's not asking you, be perfect. But he's saying, follow the one who is. Follow the one who is. And in that, I'm going to build the plans I have for you in your life. And you're not going to be the same. I am in awe of this place. Not because of the preaching. Definitely not because of the drum playing. <laughs> Listen to this. It's because around this place... We have so many walking miracles. We have walking examples of God's faithfulness. But I will tell you this. Keep going. You can do this. God is going to do this in you. Stay focused. Stay absolutely tied into God. If you fail, don't step on your own neck. Uh, absolutely embrace the grace and forgiveness God has for you. It's something beautiful when we can confess our sins to God. He takes our sins and he covers us in his blood and he gives us more opportunity to get it right. Amen. Then you and I will begin to understand the plans he has for us and will be an example of everywhere we walk that God is faithful. So I'll ask you these two, this question. Do you love him? Yes. Feed his sheep. Amen. Love the Lord. Love the neighbors yourself. Let us focus on that. And we will continue to be his refuge. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together. <laughs> Father, we come before you. Thank you so much that you're a God that has a plan for us. A plan, Lord, that we don't even get to determine if we want it or not. Lord, that if we love you, you will accomplish those things in us. Scripture tells us that you are the author and the finisher of our faith. So, Father, help us to surrender, to let go of what we think we need, and to trust you with our life. And in doing that, Lord, may we love you and may we love well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for coming.